Hello and welcome to the Connected TV World Summit and today's panel on harnessing the user experience to boost attention, loyalty, and profit. Uh, I'm Jana Greco from Broadcast Projects and with me today are Patrick Verdon, who is the uh, head of sales engineering at TiVo and Alejandro Casals Gomez, who is head of TV business development at the Dutch Telco KPN. Welcome to both of you, and thank you very much for joining us today. Hi, Jan. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. So we're here to talk about the user experience and the main ways not only to boost enjoyment, but to win operators more loyalty and ultimately more profit as they battle in this war to win eyeballs. So I wanted to start with you, Patrick. I know that you're a big metadata aggregator. Your business has uh, gone well beyond that over the years. You're a TV operator in your own right. And I just wanted to ask you, um, how is TiVo, TiVo different to other big aggregators in terms of aiding the content discovery process? Sure, thanks, Jan. Um, I, I think maybe where we're different is, you know, we do have a, a long history with, with metadata aggregation around the world. But we've looked, and, and even from an organizational perspective, actually, there is the team has now merged into a discovery team. So we don't just look at metadata, we look at metadata, we look at search and recommendation, we look at voice services, which are a key part of, of any solution, obviously, but also, you know, that ties in with metadata and discovery. And then we have the analytics piece that sits on top, um, and obviously our, our UX business around the world as well. Mm -hmm. But I think where we do see differentiation is you know the, the the type of metadata historically the linear schedules that you would have had and even the vod assets that you would have had time and title etc i think we're we're moving beyond that from a kind of creation perspective where we're looking at richer sets of data and obviously there's a lot of talk around imagery how do you have different imagery for different devices or different services or even different individuals but then also our concept of deep discovery which is taking basically AI tools to generate much further, deeper levels of metadata than you would typically have, and then using them to enhance the discovery experience. So I think, you know, to your original question, again, it's, it's, it's more of a, a holistic discovery solution and metadata plays a part in that, but so does search and recommendation and so does personalization and voice, et cetera. Right, so more of an ecosystem solution. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I wanted to ask Alejandro. Hello, Alejandro. How are you today? Hi, Jeanette. I'm fine. <laughs> Thanks. Good. Um, so if you had three months, just three months, to boost the time a household would spend with your platform or streaming service by just 10%, what would you do to the user experience? Yeah, it's a very good question. So um, yeah, in just three months, I, I think uh, yeah, I would I would really focus on on the low hanging fruit. So I think you yeah you really can achieve a lot with with the basics. So uh, um, yeah, helping the user in your UI to find the the right content, the content which is uh, trending, for instance, at the moment. So uh, we see that the yeah the content rights are shifting. Uh, at least here in the Netherlands, we see a lot of movement in the last uh, weeks and months around the Formula One, for instance, darts, which are very popular sports in the Netherlands. They are shifting from one, one channel or one content owner to another. And uh, we as aggregator, yeah, we have the mission to help our users to, to find the content they want to watch. So I, I really think with, with uh, yeah, uh, putting on your home screen, which content is trending now. So whether the uh, Roland Garros, for instance, in, 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 uh, which is uh, really a, a trending topic. So the chance that I want to watch that content is really high. Or the Euro Soccer, which is coming up next month. Uh, if you can put that on your home screen, that really helps uh, the, the user find the, the content uh, he or she probably wants to watch. Um, so that's on one side, uh, yeah, uh, focusing on the trending content. Uh, on the other hand, you can also focus on editorial, uh, so uh, content which is, uh, for instance, premiering shortly this week or next week, uh, or content which is new on your platform, you can also put it in a prominent place in your home screen. Uh, so these are, uh, from my point of view, really the, the low-hanging fruit, the, the easy ways you can uh, yeah, help increase the, the usage on your platform uh, in a really short uh, period of time. 
So it's a bit of a curated and editorialized approach there. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And also based on metrics around yeah, trending content uh, right now or what was trending yesterday, for instance. Mm -hmm. Patrick, what would be the game changer move that you would do for a 10% increase? I think um, I think actually, and I can give you a, a number because we, we we do this on our own service. But but improving the first time user experience. So when somebody actually gets the service for the first time, when they plug it in, I think often we give them a vanilla version and they 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 play with it, and sometimes we learn about their behavior. But what we are starting to do is actually have curated A B tests when our customers plug the service in. So what we'll do is we'll show them two pieces of content and we'll say, do you prefer this content versus this content? So maybe, you know, Game of Thrones versus Suits. And then we'll ask them another question and the questions are all interrelated and we start building a profile as we, as we go down that, that road. And after about seven questions, you can actually build quite a good profile and you can start personalizing recommendations to them from day one. Mm -hmm. So it's that cold start experience. And, and what we find is there's a, there's a kind of a 15 day window when a service, when a solution, you know, somebody starts using a solution for the first time. And there is quite high churn rates within that. And I think churn is a, you know, a bigger metric for us than, you know, hours watched. But if you have people within that 15 day period, if you expose them to a good cold start experience, we, we see churn reduced by 30% within that 15 day window. So I think that's the first thing I do. I would, I would start at, at day one and then implement personalization through that kind of first time user experience. Got it. And Alejandro, if you had more, more time, 18 months for a 25% increase, what would you do then? Yeah, so um, I think then, yeah, I would really look into yeah, uh, AI and big data. So uh, not, yeah, to focus not just on, on uh, helping the user find the right content, but also engaging and making sure that the, the user stays on, on the UI so that uh, after he finds something he wants to watch, he finds another thing and he gets the right recommendations. So uh, I would really focus on yeah, harnessing the, the power of, of data mm -hmm. uh, to uh, yeah, help the user find more content that he would like to enjoy. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's on one side based on yeah data and recommendations uh, and of course another topic which could help the user is uh, is voice but uh, yeah we can talk later about that no it's fine um so i mean are you profiling the users in the way that uh, patrick was just speaking about in terms of being able to uh do this a b testing yeah yeah, I think profiling is uh, a bit device depending. Uh, there are, of course, some devices which are more personal, like smartphone. Uh, so there you are yeah, pretty sure that it's always the same user which, which is watching uh, on that device. So you can work easier with profiles. Uh, when uh, Conversely, when you are looking on a set of box, it's, it's more like a, a shared device when you are enjoying content with, with different users within the household. Uh, and there it's a bit more challenging, challenging to know uh, who is uh, watching when. Uh, of course, there are some uh, innovation around that with, with voice fingerprinting or uh, even uh, remote controls with, which yeah, can detect who is in front of the TV, but it remains a challenge since maybe somebody is, is controlling the TV, but it's actually more people who are uh, sitting in front of the TV. Uh, so we've well, seen yeah. that in many many services where it's very unclear who the user is, and uh, you end up with this kind of synthesized health, household profile that maybe in some cases works fine, but in other cases, when there are children with multiple ages in the house or whatever, that it doesn't work so fine. And then there's this issue of having to to push the button every time you go into the interface. So voice probably plays a huge uh, role here in this uh, in this context. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think, yeah, maybe in the, yeah, I think in out loud, probably if, if uh, on the spot you can, uh, based on, on the choice on the navigation on that moment uh, from a user, you can see what kind of people is sitting in front of the TV at that moment. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really challenging. And uh, as I said, it's much easier if you are focusing on profiles on, uh, on, on smartphone device because you are pretty sure 
it's the same user who is using that device all the time. Mm -hmm. Patrick, what yeah. would you do over a longer period of time to increase that, get that 25% boost? Um, well, I, I think I think voice is a, voice is a key one, and maybe we'll get to that as a standalone topic. But I think from a from a personalization perspective, and I guess when I when I mean personalization, I don't I don't necessarily mean profiles. I mean you know personalization on a device, as Alejandro says, on a mobile device, it can be very different from in the the in home. But I think you know when we talk about personalization, we take the the data, the viewership data, and we analyze what people watch on a device. So obviously, there's different behaviors on different devices. And we personalize the content that people see. So you get on, on you know, the, the solutions I think are important. You get an aggregated view. So the concept of super aggregation and it's personalized. But then what we are starting to do is not just personalize horizontally, but also personalize vertically. Mm -hmm. So Alejandro, you mentioned the, the Euros, the, the soccer coming up. You know, if, if I, so I do like soccer. So, you know, I think I should start seeing paracels or rails related to soccer coming more prominent in my UI. Um, but then, you know, Janet, maybe you like movies or some other different types of content. You should be exposed to a different type of content. So we're moving into this world of not just personalizing the, the, the actual video content going across, but also uh, vertically having different UIs for different individuals. And that's something that we're starting to see roll out with, with pretty significant success at the moment. And it, it goes beyond that then, right? Because if you're in, a, in an OTT world where you've got lots of OTTs, um, we are starting to then personalize recommendations for different OTTs. So if you like, again, if you like lots of movies um, and you watch movies on Netflix, you know, there's probably not much point in recommending a sports uh, app to you or sports OTT, but you might like something like Mubi, which is a very, you know, uh, a, a service that I use, which is like art house cinema. Not everybody's going to like that, but if you recommend it to the right people, then they'll watch it. So it's a, it's, it's about personalization, not, not just of the content in the traditional sense, but personalization of the experience. And I think that has a significant impact and, and not just again on viewership, but on churn, and then also the concept of effective catalog size. Alejandro, you'll, I guess you'll be familiar with this in terms of, you know, it's not really how many hours you watch content, it's the different mix of content. So how many series or movies do you watch over a given period? And I think, you know, if you can personalize the experience, you see real improvements there. So let's stop and talk for a minute about um, user profiles. How do we actually, what are the mechanisms available to us for distinguishing one person from another? Is it mainly voice as the kind of the, the one that works the best or are there other mechanisms and you know, how reliable are they in terms of delivering that level of personalization that you're talking about? Well, I, th I think um, it's kind of a hot topic at the moment because different people have different versions. As Alejandro said, you know, you, you have the, the, the remote control, which is like the haptic technology where it recognizes uh, different people. I, I maybe see a limitation there in terms of it's quite expensive. You know, suddenly you've got now a remote control, which is going to cost, you know, the bill of materials is going to increase. So that's, that's not always positive, but there's good technology there. I think from our perspective, we see voice as a, a very, um, very easy way for people to enroll or even just to build personalization. So when I speak into the remote control and I say, you know, show me comedy movies, it'll show me the comedy movies that I've watched because it'll build a profile based on my viewership experience. Yeah, but what now, if it doesn't you... know it's you? I mean, what if your whole family is watching the, the, the thing? So it's based on the voice yeah. fingerprint is what you're saying. Of you. so, so, so there's an extension. Yeah, exactly. It's based on the voice okay. fingerprint, but it's not the only measurement that you use, right? So you need to think about, okay, so it's in the living room. So in the living room, it's more of a shared experience. It's at, you know, six o'clock on a Saturday evening. That's when we watch movies in our house for some reason. So six o'clock on a Saturday evening, there's usually kids movies go on the TV. So you know that because you build a mixture of the event data that you've seen through the last you know, 60 days, 100 days of viewing. You blend that with the profile of, of the voice and then you can start to really personalize the experience. Mm -hmm. There is just, just to touch on really quickly because it's, it's, it's more future-based, but there is an approach that we're starting to look at that you know, there are lots of cameras in the home at this point. And you know, I'm looking at a camera here and I'm also looking at a TV here. So if there was a way where you could actually see the people in the room, 
but not necessarily in a way that would be discernible to a human, but maybe discernible to a machine. So, you know, you could have an algorithm that could look at the, the, look at the camera, could see, okay, there's two people in the room, therefore that's more of po possibly an adult experience and possibly a couple. If there's four people or five people, then maybe that's a family experience. I think that's an interesting kind of byproduct of COVID as well, that people are more used to having cameras in the living room, which we would never have done before. And at the conversation that we're having now, we have some different technologies across TV and across Xperia that can actually do that. The question is, is the world ready for that level? So that's what we're trying to, we're trying to explore at the moment. Alejandro, any comments about that from you? Yeah, that's a good, <laughs> a good topic you are talk, talking about, Patrick, because yeah, it it's starts to get a bit spooky with all this uh, voice fingerprinting and the cameras in the living room. So uh yeah it's it's going to be challenging to see what the yeah acceptance will be by by users to have all these kind of of recognitions so we already see with uh, with with voice controls for instance the, the the near field versus far field so we see a difference in acceptance when you have a, a far field microphone or a speaker which is always always on always listening versus uh, a near field when it's which is all only at, activated at the moment you press the button on the remote so that makes a, a big difference for for users to say okay i'm i'm not being uh, uh eavesdrop uh, the whole time but just when i when i want to use it when i press the button on the remote control then it's listening to me so that helps in the acceptance uh maybe it's it's a process eh? so uh, in the end we'll all end with cameras and speakers uh, all around us. And I see also there is a difference between uh, the more than us, the, the older generations and the younger people. So uh, younger people are more, yeah, uh, they don't care that much, I think, about all these aspects. So maybe it's, it's just, just a matter of time and, and yeah, we are, we are getting there, but there is definitely an, an acceptance uh, path. So, so we need some time for people to yeah, to get used to it, to see that they really have a benefit from that, because it's it's yeah all what that we do, all the, all these things are yeah intended to help the customer uh, find the content they, they want to watch in an easier way. Uh, yeah, so currently we we have an offer yeah aggregated offering as as a super aggregator uh, uh, role that we have as as KPN. So we yeah embrace content from different sources, and we yeah our goal is to help the user find this content uh, yeah in an easy way. Uh, so if if all these means can help in that in that sense, I think the the user will yeah see the benefits of that and will yeah be more prone to accept all these kind of new innovation we are talking about. I, th I think just just quickly, I think there there is one use case that will really drive this forward very quickly, and and that's that's kids. And, and kids using voice because kids, when you show kids a remote control with voice, that once they start using it, they use it all the time because UIs are quite complex. Even super aggregate UIs are quite complex and they will, they will use it and use it and use it. But we, we, we have built capability and we're, we're hoping to roll out shortly with a customer where if, if my kid picks up the remote control and says, show me scary movies, they will be showing scary movies like Casper the ghost rather than some terrible you know 18s <laughs> horror movie that's completely inappropriate or if they have a kid's own, I don't know Alejandro do you have a kid's own on your service or is that something that you do today? yes we do yeah so that's definitely yeah, yeah. something uh, yeah for for recommendation indeed in the UI so it's not about the right content but as you say Patrick also the right environment so we yeah we have implemented also the the kids what we call the kids environment yeah uh, yeah yeah we, we see voice maybe it's an entry and an exit point for that so you know if the kid speaks they go straight to the kid zone and then if the parent picks up then they're taken back to the normal UI. so i i i think that's going to happen and and that's that's something we're actively rolling out actually so that could that could be the first step super interesting so voice as a as a mechanism for parental control yeah and maybe also there is one use case, uh, another perk, let's say, of, of voice control, which is not maybe uh, mainstream, but it's, yeah, it's, it's really important. And it's also the accessibility. Uh, yes. So for people with, uh, with an impairment, uh, a visual impairment, it really helps to, to, to be able to control the, the set-top box via voice. 
because it really, really helps find and discover the content in a much, much easier way than, than navigating the UI. Yeah, we're, we're doing explorations in that area as well. That is, that is super interesting. So what about the next steps? Uh, Patrick, you scared the daylights out of me with your talk about uh, microphones and cameras in my house. It's bad enough I've had to build a TV studio in my office <laughs> these days. So uh, what are the next steps in how we're going to be implementing voice? Uh, you've talked about uh, cameras, microphones. What else? What are the next steps there? Yeah, I, I, and what I think uh, we ask about, you know, how we implement these things, both from an operator yeah. view and, a, and an audience view. Yeah, I, I think I think, you know, people are getting so used to voice solutions now because of, you know, Alexa and Google and others. And it's, it's you know, people are getting, it, you know, there's there's a generation that are native to these solutions. So they are very used to it and they will continue using it. So I think it's important that we kind of innovate and have additional solutions. So one of the things that we look at, for example, is additional domains. So mm -hmm. not just, you know, video is a domain, but music is also a domain. And then, you know, can you, can you have voice search across those two domains? Um, news is a domain, weather is a domain, you know, sports. We, we particularly in TiVo, we, you know, we look at it from an entertainment perspective. We don't want necessarily to go, you know, completely outside that loop and start ordering pizzas or ordering taxis. That's not what we will do. But there are enough adjacent domains that we think the living room is a good UI or the TV is a good UI for those experiences. And, you know, I think it starts to extend a little bit into IoT as well. Maybe it's like a doorbell, for example, or security. So I think there is a, 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 you know, the IoT thing is starting to come together and, and, and perhaps the TV is the center point of that. You know, it's in the center of most people's homes and it's a big, big fancy screen. So it can do lots of different things all at the same time. So I see that as probably, you know, a next step that other people start getting involved in different domains and bringing all that into a central solution on the TV, but voice acting as the gateway to those uh, domains. And the, and the voice um, technology that you offer is very conversational, but I'm wondering whether or not consumers actually discover things that it can't ask. In other words, you've given some, give me previously some examples of how it works and the kinds of things you can ask, but are there yeah. some limits to the types of questions that you can, you know, that you can pose to an automated uh, voice discovery interface that it just won't figure out? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 <laughs> software and technology, right? So it, thankfully, it all is, has its limitations. Otherwise, me and Alejandro would be have different jobs. But um, I think, you know, so from a conversational perspective, it's very much, you know, having that intuitive chat with with the TV. So you say, find me comedy movies, okay? Just the ones from the '90s, just the ones with Owen Wilson, and we 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 build heavily on that. I think where where it could get to that point, John, and actually when it gets to multi domains. It is possible to confuse a voice solution, right? If you say, play Will Smith. So Will Smith is an actor. He's also a hip hop artist. He might be someone else. There might be, it might be a historian called Will Smith. So one of the things that we've, we were looking at is it was a concept we call multi-turn, which is basically the system having a conversation with you to try and try and understand a little bit deeper, disambiguate the question. So if I say play Will Smith, maybe the service asks me, do you want music from Will Smith or do you want Men in Black? So right. I think there's definitely queries that we won't hit first time, but I think there's enough capability out there that you could actually build a conversation with the service and then get to that point. So mm -hmm. I, yeah, I guess, you know, it, it, it's true, it won't happen, but I think there's tools there. Yeah, and you said the kids are the more likely to take it up or and keep using it over and over. Are there, do you think, some data privacy concerns on the part of audiences that would make them be a yeah. little bit squeamish about all of this stuff? Yeah, I mean, data, yeah, data privacy is a question you get asked every day, and it, and it is it's super important, right? I mean, I, I take it very seriously in my house, so I, I, <laughs> everybody else should. Um, I think you know, from from our perspective, the way our voice solutions work. You know, we introduced one of our major rollouts right as GDPR was happening. So I went through that that fun and game. Um, but I think, you know, we're very careful that we don't take any actual 
personalized data in terms of anything about the household other than a series of IDs. So we know that the house has an ID, but we have no capability of, of referring back to what that means on a demographic level. Yeah. So basically what happens is we, we have a kind of a speech to text solution that send us the audio. And, but when they send that, they send us anonymized IDs that are effectively hashed. We then carry out the natural language understanding, do the response, do the recommendation, send that back. But we have no idea where that goes at the end point. We just have this hashed ID that the service provider then you know, turns into a, into a human. So it, it's right to be concerned about it. People are right to be concerned about it. I think GDPR is, is, is changing. It's already evolving into you know, what does processing of personal data mean? So I think that that's positive. I think one of the things that is interesting, it's worth looking at in the future is, is, is the concept of edge computing. And can you actually process AI tools on a device? So could you have a voice solution that does not get sent to the cloud that actually processes it on the remote control or on the set, up, set top box? Right. And that's an area that we're interested in. I think, I think more and more people are going to be aware of privacy. And there, there's lots of, you know, there's lots of good reasons why that might happen. And, and you've, there's been cases of cloud solutions been hacked. There's been, you know, yeah. where I am in Dublin, the health service got hacked recently and people's personal data got stolen. So, you know, it, it is a concern. I think there's good regulation out there. Maybe we need some more, but also the technology is maybe going to solve some of that problem for us. Right. So you mentioned AI and machine learning there, and I just wanted to, to move on a little bit because um, we're talking about deep data, deep data linking uh, that's possible with uh, obviously the gigantic TiVo metadata set. But I'm just wondering, uh, you know, how do we help channels and um, streaming platforms be able to make their content more serviceable? I mean, there's a kind of uh, the, this move towards super aggregation and being able to, to search across multiple, multiple apps. Uh, I think both of your companies are able to, to do both of that. I'm just curious about the role of uh, AI and machine learning in the metadata extraction experience and also how that all wraps up to, to create a better experience for the audience. Yeah, sure. And, and uh, just as we were talking about kids, there's kids in the background playing, so apologies for any background noise, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> I think there's kind of, if you're a content owner or a content creator, you have an app, there's, there's kind of two challenges you have today. Uh, one is within your own app, how do you get people to come to the app? If they watch one show, how do you get them to stay within the app so they don't get distracted and go elsewhere? So that, that kind of in-app in experience. The other challenge is super aggregation, right? I mean, we, we spend a lot of time talking about super aggregation, but that's a challenge to content owners as well, because they are now having their content up against Disney Plus that has, you know, infinite budget versus what maybe a local European content creator has, for example. So in, in service, I think personalization is super important because you can keep people in the service. But in a super aggregated world, if you have deep level metadata, if you have this concept of deep discovery, which, you know, as we said, uses AI tools to pull out things like, you know, tone, theme, mood, um, you know, the, the time period the content was created, then you can start to create links between content. Um, and, you know, if you can then, you know, allow other services to make recommendations of your content. So if somebody watches one piece of content from a solution, then they should get recommended something from that solution again, if it has the right metadata tagging. And I think that's super important because it's so competitive at the moment that you know, to rely on traditional metadata would, would not work. You need to go deeper, you need to get into tones and themes, et cetera. Right, and um, Alejandro, are you able to, 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 to do this with your existing metadata provider? Are you able to, to get down to this level of granularity or are you using any kind of AI and machine learning to automatically extract metadata for your services? Uh, no, at the moment we are yeah, relying on a, on a local provider for our mm -hmm. EPG. So for our linear TV uh, EPG information, we rely on a, on a Dutch uh, company because yeah, we, we are a Dutch operator. So we believe it's, it's yeah, really good to have a, a party which is close, working closely with, uh, with the broadcasts in the Netherlands. Um, so that's yeah, purely the, 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 the metadata based on the content. 
on top of that, uh, yeah, you could, as Patrick said, enrich the metadata by using AI. So analyze the content, uh, video, audio, uh, but also, for instance, the, the subtitling of, of, of the content that's being broadcasted and, and use that to enrich your metadata and improve the yeah, searchability of your content. Mm. We have done some tests uh, in the past about that, but we are not using that uh, at the moment. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, one place where you can apply uh, AI and, and machine learning. Uh, the other part where you can do that is uh, based on uh, the data you can collect on, on, the, on the navigation from your customers. So how are your users, users using your UI? Which parts of your UI are being most used, which less? How can you surface your content much better? So you can uh, use these metrics to improve your user experience, use your, your user, user interface, and in that way make uh, content, uh, I, yeah, actually surface that content so that users can find it more easily. And in this sense, yeah, we are, we are using this metadata to improve continuously our, our user interface. And is it easy to uh, access the metadata of all these very many apps that are out there right now? I mean, I imagine they're covered by contracts, but is everyone wanting to equally play the game of uh, letting you be able to deep, ac deep access to their data sets or how is that playing out? Yeah, so it's uh, in our own environment. So we, we can ask permission from the user, of course, and we can collect this data. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, when a user is yeah, jumping to another app uh, in another environment like Netflix or YouTube or somewhere else. So uh yeah this is uh, outside of our of our ecosystem so we we cannot see what's happening in there we just can see that the user launched this this app uh but yeah within our environment we can we can see at least the way the user has found for instance netflix we have different ways to access netflix you can do it through uh, an app section or it can be through a channel we have channel 200 for netflix so in this way, we can see, okay, what way is uh, most used by our customers to access these apps. And based on that, we can also improve the way apps are being offered to our customers. Sounds like the world is being definitely driven by data science these days. Yeah, and the, the problem is, yeah, the data is there, but the problem is harnessing the, the, all the power from this data. So in, right. in an efficient way and effective way. Right. That's, that's really the challenge. So what about the super aggregator status? I mean, does everyone have to become a super aggregator these days for success? Yeah, um, as I said before, it's, it's, it's part of our main strategy as KPN to, yeah, to help our customers in, their, in this jungle of, of content, which is becoming more and more uh, uh, fragmented and, and being offered in different apps. Uh, so we, yeah, we see it there uh, a role for KPN to help our users to to find the content they want to watch, and once they have found this content, to consume it in an in an easier way. So, uh, for instance, for Net Netflix, we have implemented the KPN billing, so a user can uh, discover mm -hmm. content from Netflix, uh, and yeah, if he wants to play back this content and he's not a, a Netflix subscriber yet, then we. Yeah, we give the customer the opportunity to have the billing for Netflix uh, as part of their current KPN bill, uh, the billing engagement with KPN. Right. Um, when the user is connecting another set of box at home, uh, then we have implemented this silent sign-in process. So the user doesn't need to enter this uh, cumbersome uh, email address and password, password with a remote control, which is... Mm -hmm. uh, something nobody wants to do but the, the auto set of box automatically detects okay this is the same customer we already have a, a billing relationship with him so the, the 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 user is automatically signed in on the netflix app so yeah i see our goal to make the the the, the life easier for our customers in this uh, more complex world mm -hmm. to uh, well to find the content and consume the content that our users want very good Patrick, any last thoughts? What is the success model for a super aggregator? Well, I, I think, you know, obviously the last couple of weeks, there's been some pretty big heavyweight mergers of, you know, services. And it's clear that that's all about, you know, having more content on, on single solutions, but also 
I think we're starting to see as hopefully we move beyond COVID that that flurry of activity where people had seven paid services in their living room. I think that's starting to come down. I think I think that will continue to come down because people mm. are realizing that, you know, having seven OTTs is just as expensive as the cables service. So you're not actually cutting right. a cord. You're just like right. creating a new one. So I think <laughs> that that will that will change. I think, you know, I think AVOD, we haven't really touched on AVOD too much, but I think that's, that's you know, it's, it's been here for a while now, but I think that's starting to get some real traction in terms of actual yeah. volume watched and, you know, it's free. So that helps. So I think super aggregation will continue, I think, but people will get smarter on the commercial side. So I think people will be less willing yeah. to pay for lots of different services. I think AVOD will become more important. I think, you know, obviously Alejandro touched on linear, linear is not going anywhere, especially with sport. Right. So right. there is, you know, there, I think the model will shift, but I still think the concept of super aggregation will hold firm and yeah. it'll just be maybe aggregating a smaller pool of solutions than it is today. Yeah. I think you're right. I think you're right. So ease of use and a little bit more consolidation in terms of how the services are presented to the users. Yeah. Very yeah, good. Absolutely. That's all we have time for. I want to thank you very, very much, both of you for joining us today and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.